If Formula One only lives on excitement and overtaking, it's in trouble. But whoever leads Formula One down that path, shame on them because there's so much more to Formula One than excitement and overtaking. We have the teams telling us that part of Formula One's DNA is its technology and that in order to be even in the World Championship, you've got to design and build your own car. And the technology is wonderful, but now we're going even further down the road towards 50% electrification, zero carbon. If that's the case, open the doors of the garage, please. Let's see what the Ferrari spark plug that they changed on the Carlos Sainz engine overnight actually looks like. How big is the, is the Ferrari spark plug? I have no idea. I'm assuming it's about the size of my fingernail and it's a pretty cool bit of kit. Why don't we ever see that stuff? He just makes sure that he's not wasting any time on the entry to the corner by prolonging the entry, by breaking as late as he possibly can. All he's interested in is shortening the corner. He doesn't think about having a high minimum speed. He doesn't think about getting on the power as soon as possible. All he's thinking about is how long can I can extend that straight and then turn it, which means obviously turning slightly towards the entry of the corner. He's not looking at the entry of the corner, he's looking at the point where he's going to rotate the car, and that's what he breaks to. And then telling, telling Charles Leclerc to drive a clean, fast stint. I mean, imagine if Christian Horner got on the radio and said that to Max Verstappen. Oh, Max, uh, this stint, we'd like you to drive uh, cleanly and fast, please. What do you think Max is going to say? <laughs> or Lewis, for that matter. You know, to me, that comes under the heading of, as I said in my video, it's a bit like a headmaster or a teacher. You know, telling a five-year-old how to behave and it's just ridiculous. Welcome back to another episode of the F1 Hour. Thank you so much for joining me with me today. We have a legend in the game, one of the goatiest F1 broadcasters that's ever goated, my friend, friend of the channel, Peter Windsor. How are you doing, sir? Well, I'm trying to grow a goatee beard, actually. Let's go. Um, that's what you're talking about, right? Uh, very, much too flattering as ever, Cam, but um, great to see you, bud. Oh, it's a privilege as always, Peter. Shall we talk about some F1, sir? Because there's a couple of questions that I have for you. Um, yeah, yeah. Mr. Verstappen, this past weekend at the Canadian Grand Prix, as a Lewis Hamilton fan, Peter, I'm starting to get excited and drink a bit of the, the hopium, let's say. Are Mercedes back in this or... Am I getting a bit premature and Max Verstappen and Red Bull are sandbagging? Which of the two you reckon? Um, well, as a Lewis Hamilton fan, I think you could get excited about Mercedes being a bit nearer to Aston Martin. <laughs> if you think they're going to be beating Red Bull in the near future, other than in a one-off situation with lots of variables coming into play, uh, I think you're going to be disappointed. I don't think we saw... Max extending the RB19 at any point of the race. And, and that showed particularly in top speed. I mean, they were just saving fuel. They were doing all sorts of things. And uh, they had a lot of margin they were playing with. And that showed in the consistency of lap time. When you see Max, I mean, Max is incredibly consistent anyway. But when you see him hammering out laps, when he's got no grip, he says, within a tenth of one another over a 10-lap period, you know that he's got, a, you know, he's got probably three tenths, four tenths worth of margin there, if yeah. not more. So, yeah, I mean, Mercedes is making progress. Obviously, this car seems to be a bit better. Uh, a lot of bouncing. I mean, Lewis was pretty knackered after the race. And, and the first thing he said to Max, I thought was quite interesting, was, you know, how bad was the bouncing? And, you know, Max, obviously, Max isn't going to give anything away. away. And, he, and he, he would have said, oh, yeah, yeah, it was really bad. Yeah, but it wasn't that bad on the Red Bull, that is for sure. And you know, we haven't even really seen any upgrades yet on that car. They don't really need to upgrade it. They can just save everything and put it into the 24 car, can't they? So, yeah, you know, short of Adrian Newey deciding he's going to leave Red Bull and go to Mercedes, I think, um, you know, carry on Max, that's what I would say. Oh, Peter, it doesn't bode well. But don't be Mac such a Lewis fan. I mean, I'm a Lewis fan, but I'm a Max fan as well. Yeah, I think, you know, this polarisation of, of, of fans. I was a Jim Clark fan, but I wasn't averse to John Surtees, Dan Gurney or Graham Hill winning the odd race. And I wasn't averse to, I was a Nigel Mansell fan, but I was, you know, pretty pleased when Ricardo Patrese won a race and uh, Alan Prost, I used to get on well with Alan. You know? Well, I still do. I, I just think this whole thing about I'm this fan or that fan, I think 
Formula One is because it's so dominated by cars, 60% car, 40% driver, when a car crosses the line. You've got to be, you've got to have an open mind. And you, if you're just a fan of a driver, you're going to be disappointed inevitably at some point because what can he do if he doesn't have a winning car? I love that, Peter. Let, let's talk to that for a second because I'm, I'm a bit concerned for Liberty Media in their push to broaden the sports scope, right? That they've done a brilliant job with Netflix. Apparently one in four people watching F1 today as at June 2023 have come into the sport via Drive to Survive. Peter, do you share my opinion that Liberty Media potentially going to have a problem because one of four don't watch F1 through the lens that you and I do and they're just they're here for the the 2021 blood and guts type scenario, right? That And potentially that the FIA are going to have to do something to peg back Red Bull sooner rather than later to, to, to save themselves a massive exodus of the new fans that they've done so well in attracting. Um, well, uh, yeah. I actually don't agree with a lot of things you've just said. I mean, I, I'm a, I don't need... Netflix to make me a fan of Formula One. That's the first thing. So it's difficult for me to, to see it through the prism of somebody who can only grasp Formula One from that angle. That's the first point. Secondly, long before Netflix, long before Drive to Survive, going back to the early 2000s, maybe even the late 90s on F1 racing, I was beating the drum about how Formula One undersells itself and doesn't put over the really fascinating side of its industry, which is yeah. all the stuff that goes on behind the scenes in the garage. Moment. And that's kind of what Drivers, Drive to Survive has, has sort of initially touched the outer surface of the iceberg of. But there's a massive iceberg underneath there that nobody's got anywhere near. And if, if you go back to read some of my columns from those days, it included live coverage of the driver's briefings. It included... GoPro cameras in road cars to hear what was really being said in the cars they're driving to and from the track. It included midweek shows, chat shows, where you've got Max talking to Fernando Alonso uh, live on chat shows. It included the top three drivers in the World Championship being a world tour over the winter. Uh, yeah. Partly, you could justify it with charity for sure, but doing lots of mega chat shows, kart racing celebrities. It included having um, driver swaps periodically and putting drivers in interesting cars. It included a lot of stuff that Formula One isn't even going near. And so my view of Formula One is that there's still a massive amount out there to be done to sell this show correctly. And I think Drive to Survive is a step in the right direction, but I think it's a tiny, tiny step of what is available out there. And, and if, you're absolutely right. If Formula One only lives on excitement and overtaking it's in trouble but whoever leads formula one down that path shame on them because there's so much more to formula one than excitement and overtaking because if you want that as i said a million times go and watch moto gp or nascar or something else yeah, formula one is not about that formula one is about all the other stuff it's about technology it's about intrigue it's about big business it's about world travel it's about saving the planet. It's about the biggest budgets you're ever going to see in sport. It's about the world's biggest global TV audience. It's about all those things. And as I keep saying, I think that the Netflix show touches 1% of that. And we've got so much further to go. And I still don't understand why there's this thing about allowing the teams to dictate what should be shown and what isn't. Oh. I mean, we, whenever the technical regulations come up for review, we have the teams telling us that part of Formula One's DNA is its technology and that in order to be even in the World Championship, you've got to design and build your own car. And the technology is wonderful. But now we're going even further down the road towards 50% electrification and zero carbon. If that's the case, open the doors of the garage, please. And let's see what the Ferrari spark plug that they changed on the Carlos Sainz engine overnight actually looks like. How big is the, is the Ferrari spark plug? I have no idea. I'm assuming it's about the size of my fingernail and it's a pretty cool bit of kit. Why don't we ever see that stuff? And, and, and it's absolutely ridiculous that, that the teams control how much technology is the public are allowed to enjoy. 
And as I've also said a million times, technology actually is not about spark plug size. It's about people. It's about Adrian Newey doing a better job than other engineers. That is a fascinating human story. Where's the Netflix story on that? You know, <laughs> I don't see it anywhere. And so you get my point. You know, I think we've got, we've touched 1% of what there is to sell at Formula One. Let's sell the other 99% now. And let's not go down the path of overtaking and it's got to be exciting and counting a number of overtakes. Let's go down the path of the technology is just as dramatic as, as, as the, the racing once the green lights go out. And let's go down the path of how Zach Brown tries to sell Formula One on Wall Street. I'd love to have a, ca a camera going into him when he's going into a meeting trying to sell Formula One to the, the, the chairman of PepsiCo or whatever it's going to be. I mean, that's brilliant Formula One. That is all Formula One. But we never see any of it. Yeah. That's my point. Yeah, it's a shame. I suppose you've got the perfect storm, right, Peter? If you've got all of the stuff that you talked about and bonus, you've got Max and Lewis and Alonso in equal-ish machinery able to battle it out, right? That, well, that's... I, I, again, I'm not sure you're right there, Cameron, because because just as good television is the camera on Lewis Hamilton at the end of the Canadian Grand Prix when all the podium's over and he's gone into the into the Mercedes motorhome and he slams his helmet down and says, I could not believe how good that Red Bull was in the five laps. I couldn't even live with it. You know, that's what I want to see. And just because Max was pulling away and winning the race, it doesn't take away from the drama yeah. of what it's like for everybody else to live with that situation and to how to fight back on that situation. That is the story. The story is not, oh, isn't it boring? Max has pulled away. The story is, wow, look how these guys are going to try and react. That is the story. And nobody's getting hold of that because the teams won't allow them to. Yeah, it's a shame. And if it's... Netflix aren't getting hold of that, shame on them. Yeah, absolutely, Peter. Bloody Nora. All right, then, man, let's talk about some drivers tangenting very quickly. Um, you talked about on, I want to say it was your Monaco video because you were there in person, right? You took some absolutely incredible shots of Max, I think, going into Raskas as versus Fernando Alonso. Can we get techie for a second, Peter, and explain to me if, if Max is on the way to greatness, as I think he is, explain to me what he's doing so well that an Alonso isn't doing in Tarascas as far as his short corners is concerned. Well, he's doing what Sterling Moss did. He's doing what Jim Clark did. He's doing what Jackie Stewart did. He's doing what Nicky Lauda did. He's doing what actually Jean Alesi did quite well. Um, you get my point. He's not the only guy in the world to drive with short corners. It's, they're all, all the great Grand Prix drivers do drive in the simple logic that the straights are just as important as the corners and the straight has two ends. And the longer you can extend those ends, the better the lap's going to be. So you shorten the corner as much as possible. I'm going to be talking about this in a video coming up soon. But in a nutshell, he just makes sure that he's not wasting any time on the entry to the corner by prolonging the entry, by breaking as late as he possibly can. All he's interested in is shortening the corner. He doesn't think about having a high minimum speed. He doesn't think about getting on the power as soon as possible. All he's thinking about is how long can I can extend that straight and then turn it, which means obviously turning slightly towards the entry of the corner. He's not looking at the entry of the corner. He's looking at the point where he's going to rotate the car, and that's what he breaks to. And that's very easy to say, and it's very easy for, for somebody like, say, Rubens Barrichello or Carlos Sainz, two classic, or Jensen Button, actually, three classic uh, long corner drivers, as I would call them. It's very easy for them to say, oh, I only break to the slowest rotation point as well. It's just that their rotation point is different to Max Verstappen's. Max Verstappen's is probably, I don't know, a metre later, and that's a massive amount when at the speed they're going. So he's able to, to extend that straight much, much longer. And then, then, of course, he's got to rotate the car. Then he's very patient. And that's, that is where the skill of a driver like a Verstappen will show in terms of what he can do. I, we, nev we never have the camera work, so we can't see actually what he's doing. But it's all footwork, and mainly footwork, but some handwork there, balancing the front end of the car against decreasing brake pedal pressure, against throttle, all the things that you can do to balance a car. Yeah. Uh, get the car rotated, and then he's just looking for a diagonal exit to get that 
to extend the beginning of the next straight for as long as possible. And that's, um, that, that showed up beautifully going into Rascasse. It shows breaking into turn 10 in Bahrain. And to some extent, as I explained uh, prior to Canada, it showed up a little bit in going into turn two in Canada because that's all about change of direction. You've got load coming through turn one. And then, but then you've got to find a moment when you can just get the car perfect set up for two. And, and the camera did not do that justice at all, I don't think, over the Grand Prix weekend. You could, you've never got a feel for how well people like Max and Lewis were doing that. But what we did see were guys like Perez and Sainz frustrated mentally, not, not, not graphically, but mentally frustrated at, at how good Max was, or in Lewis's case, uh, you know, it, Lewis was through there and their their logical conclusion was i've got to break a bit later into one in that case and i've got to get the power on a bit sooner into one and as soon as they went there it was the wrong thing to do and they just went off whereas max's speed was not into one it was between one and two that was the difference and that's i think i i find it hard to understand this but i don't think many drivers or engineers even in formula one grasp that because again none of that is visible on telemetry it's only visible if you're actually watching what's going on and using your brain wow love that peter when you get techie with this driving stuff i'm just like, well it is techie but it's hey. not again it comes back to my other point you know if you actually explain it much better than i could explain it but if you could explain it graphically in really cool graphics i think the netflix generation would love it as well it's just that because they're not you know, nobody talks about it and it's all verboten, either because they either don't understand it or they don't believe it or they think it's too complicated. Everybody shies away. But the reality is it's not that complicated. Yeah. You just look at what's going on at the circuit. I think part of the problem is that a lot of the, well, all the teams seem to have everybody on the pit wall, which is where you can see absolutely nothing at all. I don't understand. I still don't understand why they do that. Yeah. Why are the engineers out there on the track watching? Peter, I've said similar. I have said similar, but I think you do yourself a disservice, Peter, because your eye, because your 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 eye is keen, right? And you've got that technical understanding. Like even the photo, if I draw it back, the two pictures that you you took of Alonso and, and Verstappen. Like I don't know, you you've got to have a keen eye to get that picture to show exactly how. Well, it's not so a much. Different I mean, line, the right? photography was complete rubbish, obviously, <laughs> but he captured the message right. right. Now. They, you told the no, story? But the point is you've got to know, you've got to have a feel for the part of the track that is going to show this. Because the last corner isn't going to, the last corner at Monaco isn't going to show that. It's too line defined by cambers and by the exit and the narrowness of the exit. Sander Boat isn't going to show that. Because if, if you're quick, at, all it's going to show, I mean, if you could do it, you could show how Max breaks into Sander Boat compared with Perez and you'd see a massive difference in the initial brake application. And that's, and that, again, that's never shown in Formula One. And, uh, and it's a shame, I'm, I'm diverting a little bit, but if you go back to Canada, which is all, a lot of it is about high-speed braking. It's a shame that after all these years, there's still no technology to show how Max brakes compared with, say, Perez. Uh, because what Max does is he, he, he very, very faintly touches the brake pedal yeah. to get the load to the front of the car before he gives it hard braking. He's always braking with the load correctly apply it. whereas most drivers grow up through carting all the feeder formula into formula one in the belief that because it's carbon brakes and you want instant temperature you just break as hard as you po sorry uh, you just break as hard as you possibly can instantly which is wrong and 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 max is a perfect example as is lewis uh of how to break from high speed absolutely brilliant which is why you didn't see him locking up going into turn one in Barcelona when he was on medium tires and everybody else was on softs. And he had all that pressure from science around him, crowding him, but he was absolutely perfect. Why? Because he was braking perfectly, perfect use of the left foot on the pedal, perfect pressure application. And then he was braking to his own personal rotation point. He wasn't right. braking to the outside of the corner, to the entry of the corner. Two absolutely key things. And it always makes me laugh when we see in on the graphics the comparison between who's breaking later. Oh, Sergio Perez is breaking two meters later than Max, or vice versa sometimes. What they never tell us is what point they're measuring in the corner to which they're breaking. And if Max is, Max's rotation point is a meter later than Sergio Perez, you know, the fact that he's breaking at about the same time as Perez 
tells you that he's braking quite early. But why is he braking early? Because he's just getting the load in the car and he's getting the car absolutely flat and square so that he knows exactly what he can do with it, the platform. But they know, it's, a, it's an important point. When they're doing that braking thing, they never, ever, they tell you where they're taking it from, but what is the entry to the corner? You know, the, the, Max's entry is completely different to Sergio Perez's entry. So how can you compare braking points? Entry matters, Peter. Love it, mate. When I literally get very giddy when you start to talk like that. And if you like this sort of chat, make sure you get over to the Peter Windsor yeah, YouTube channel I, I, if you're I, not already for more of. God, well, sorry, thanks. But, but I think, you know, I'm saying this to you because I know you're a Lewis fan, but I want you to be a Max fan as well. And there's no reason why Lewis fans shouldn't be Max fans because the guy drives incredibly well. He's incredible. He does everything Lewis does. But right now, because he's in an Adrian Newey RB19, he's got much more scope to show what he can do. So let's enjoy seeing all those things. Let's enjoy the way he very quickly reacted to the tire temperature issue in Barcelona and started actually not having such short corners. He was actually making the corners a bit longer because he wanted to get temperature in the tires. Which is genius. In which he tweaked so. straight away. Yeah. Uh, and Lewis did too. In fairness, Lewis was, you know, the, ever since Lewis has been in the B version of, of this car, He's, this is a W19, right? W13. W14B. 14, there you go. W14. Uh, he's been extending his corners as well, just to get the, the tyres to work a bit more. And, and it's working for him, compared with George. And, that, and that's what's going on. And, and, and I still say, to me, it is absolutely ridiculous that Ferrari didn't twig what Max was doing in Barcelona with tyre temperature and get the message to Charles Leclerc to start doing the same thing. I can't believe they didn't do that. Oh, Peter, what is going on at Ferrari? What do they need to do, mate? I've asked you this question before. <laughs> like, like, I love like, the way you say that, Cameron. You often say, oh, what is going on? As if it's <laughs> the end of the world. <laughs> well, you know, I'm a bit disappointed with them, obviously, like everybody else, because um, I imagined that with Fred there, that he'd be cracking the whip a bit and getting things organised. But they seem to be making the same, it seems to be the same Ferrari, doesn't it? You know, and, and things have changed a little bit. And we got it in the radio messages with Charles in, in Canada with that business of uh, twice telling him that Carlos had been told not to race him, which is a bit over the top, Evable. A, to tell him twice that. And B, I know it was two different phases of the race, but nonetheless, it's a bit over the top. Uh, and then telling, telling Charles Leclerc to drive a clean, fast stint. I mean, imagine if... Christian Horner got on the radio and said that to Max Verstappen. Oh, Max, uh, this stint, we'd like you to drive uh, cleanly and fast, please. What do you think Max is going to say? <laughs> or Lewis, Bad for that matter. You know, to me, that comes under the heading of, as I said in my video, it's a bit like a headmaster or a teacher, you know, telling a five-year-old how to behave. And it's just ridiculous. And if that's where they've got to with Charles, then they really are rock bottom, I think, in terms but of understanding but, the guy. Peter, that, let me push back on that, though. Doesn't Charles Leclerc... Because I don't think Ferrari would speak to... So they don't speak to Carlos that way, and they wouldn't speak to Max that way because he'd tell them where to go. So doesn't, at this stage, Charles need to, I don't know, just be a bit more assertive and, and constructively push back, just the way that a Carlos Sainz would? Because l lest he want to keep being treat, treated... Like a, a school kid, eh? He's got to do something. He's got to uh, he's got to own his own destiny now, Peter, because we all know he's a brilliant driver, but he's Achilles heel at the moment for me, for my money, is that he's not been as assertive as, as a Carlos Sainz or a Max or a Lewis can be. Yeah, the impression I get is that Charles has got to the point in his Ferrari career of knowing that he's pushed as hard as he can possibly push in every direction and hasn't really worked. And now he's just going to be a racing driver, drive the best possible race he can, but he's not going to get involved because there's no future in trying to do that. And politically, it's too complicated, too much pressure, and he's got to just focus on his driving. I think that's where he's at. The problem is that I think his brain is still pretty addled in terms of just having a clean weekend and... and wondering what's going to go wrong next. I think that's the problem with Charles at the moment. And because he's quite an emotional guy, as yeah. you know, he's an intelligent guy. And he's, I think in the back of his mind, he, he has this sort of very complex pressure, yeah. which Max doesn't have. And, and Lewis, to his credit, doesn't have, because it'd be quite easy for Lewis to have a lot going on in his brain as well. But he, but he manages not to have that despite everything. 
and to get in the car and still drive beautifully. And But Charles, I think, I mean, if they're saying to him twice, we've told Carlos not to race you, that's, be, that's for sure because at some point it's come up in conversation that, you know, I don't want any pressure from Carlos Sainz. And if, and if Charles thinking that way, then he's, he's confused for sure because, you know, that's... He's, he's a lot better than in terms of his technique and, and his ability. He's, he's, he's ahead of science for sure. And, um, but he's very, very mixed up. He, I think, I don't know, you often see golfers leaving um, coaches after 10 years or something. Um, not, like, uh, not like Emma, who, you know, the English girl that won the US Open and immediately sacked all her coaches. Not that. Wow. I'm doing that. After 10 years, you do it. And and then you move on. Ricky Fowler, good example. And and I think that's what Charles needs to do. I think he needs not the same. I mean, obviously, if he could leave Ferrari and go somewhere at least as good, if not better, he would do it. But there isn't anywhere for him to go. Red Bull is obviously locked up, and Mercedes, you know, unless it's a swap deal with Lewis, isn't going to happen. So, other than that, he might as well stay where he is. And I think you know he, he possibly needs a new you know whole structure there around his own life. Um, and simplify everything a bit, but I mean he's not doing too badly. I, he looked a bit. Um, he looked a bit. Well, I mean qualifying in Canada was just a mess, wasn't it? Uh, he was so good on Friday, so good in FP3, and that you know that race potentially he should have been up there with Alonso, if not ahead of Alonso. And given how well the Ferrari went on the mediums, Absolutely. I think it would have been a really good race, but it all fell apart in qualifying for Charles, uh, because they just couldn't get the temperatures. And that, to me, is, you know, that's happened once in Spain. It shouldn't have happened again. So, he, he, so here's my thing with this, Peter, and again, it speaks to my certi. Because I think, I like you, I think Leclerc is, incre- as a driver, I think he's incredible. I agree with the guys on Sky Sports that if you were to put one guy to do a hot lap in equal machinery, then I'd probably give it to Charles Leclerc. I think he's ridiculously quick but Peter if I'm in the car and I know that this is the time that we've got a window that's where slicks is going to be the tire right conditions are changing if I know that then surely it's the onus is on me Charles Leclerc to to if affect that change right make sure that I've got slicks on if I know that then put the slicks on though I don't know how Charles knows that and then ends up on out there on inters and, and well, that- I think that's the problem. And, and I was hoping, like everybody, I think, that Freddie Vasseur would change that. And But, it's, but I mean, obviously, Charles has a very good feel for racing and very good feel for what he knows he can do. Yeah. All, all, you know, without in any way wanting to sound pretentious, and I think this would apply to anybody, but you know, if I was in Frederick Vasseur's position in yeah. Canada, I would have said, absolutely go out on slicks at the beginning of Q2. Don't even think about intermediates. You've got the ability to handle it. The track is going to dry. Get out on slicks now. And I would have maybe, as a belt and braces, I would have put sights on, on intermediates. But there's, knowing that Charles had a problem with tire temperature, I would have got him on the slicks as soon as possible. And anyway, the track was going to dry. Where was the downside? I mean, it's not as if he's in a Red Bull and can blow the world championship or something. I think for Max, it was absolutely the right decision because they're well enough organised to be able to get in the bank a lap just in case the weather changed or there was a red flag or whatever. But with Ferrari, there was nothing to lose. What, what were they doing? Pratting around on intermediates and then putting him on the slicks. And five laps later, he still hadn't got him up to temperature. It was, it was so easy to read. And, and I don't know. I, I just think this is another thing about Formula One. Everybody, because of the dependence on data and what the computer's telling you to do and the number of people involved, everybody tends to do the same thing. And you often see it in practice runs on Friday or a Saturday, everybody goes out, does five laps, everybody comes in, everybody puts on the soft tar, everybody does a 20 minute soft tar run, then they all go back and do full. They all do the same thing. They're not talking to one another, but they all do the same thing because the data is telling them that is the way to run the session. And, and it was the same with Ferrari. Obviously, there's a massive drama there still between the, what let's call them the strategy people and the logical people because strategy people said absolutely get the get the lap time in on the intermediate then come out and come in and get the slicks on <sighs> you know why as you say you know it's a shame that Charles doesn't say stuff that i'm just putting the slicks on i'm doing my own thing 
But as I say, I think he's got to the point where he's given up trying to oh. fight the whole thing and just does what, you know, they tell him to do. Oh, Peter, this is cat. What an absolute I mean, he shame. He definitely had the talent to do it. And he definitely oh, sure, could have been, he, he should have been quickest in Q2 instead of Alex Albon. He should have been the guy on Slicks as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And credit to Mr. Albon, by the way, by uh, seizing the day and doing the right well, thing. Well, yeah, right and to nice, James Bolt, I think. Oh, for, brilliant. Um, you know, that. That, and that's a classic example, exactly what I'm saying. You know, as soon as he's gone there, there's a, there's a guy with a brain, guy with logic, he can feel the racing, it's in his blood, and you can see it immediately at Williams. And that, I, that's what I thought would happen with Frederick Vasseur at Ferrari. Yeah. Yeah. I have to say, I thought that would be the case. Likewise, sadly. The not. jury's out right now. Oh. Maybe... Maybe about to come back in again, to be honest. Oh my gosh, <laughs> Peter. I love it, mate. You'd be more than generous of your time. As we round third base, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions from my subscribers yeah. who were very keen to pitch a couple at you. Elliot says, if Luis Fernando or Sh Charles or George were in the second Red Bull, the RB19, where would each be in the standings relative to Max Verstappen? Oof, techie. Well, it, it's never going to be – do you mean from the start of the year? Do you mean from the start yeah, of I, testing? I do you yeah, mean I they've got that, three years of experience uh, in Red shot. Bull? You know, yeah. Uh, obviously, Max has a relationship with, with Adrian, which is well beyond the spoken word. It's being able to look at sector times. It's being able to look at facial expressions. It's being able to look at um, – What's the, what's going on with the car? Not necessarily even telemetry, but temperatures and things like that. And and so there's that. It's a sort of Clark Chapman, Andretti Chapman type thing where it's very difficult, regardless of how good the other driver is, whether he's a Lewis, a Fernando, a Russell. It's very difficult to penetrate that to the point where you can do a better job, because Adrian is only one human being. And he's he's going to be he's going to have his relationship with Max, you know, simple as that. So I don't think they would do as good an all-round job as Max if any of those three were in the other car. They'd find it difficult, I think. Yeah, so it's hard to trump that length of service in that relationship. Yeah, with Max it's not just the driver out there doing the time; it's the driver and the way he works within the team. It's you know, it's Michael circa 2002 at Ferrari knowing the name of every every mechanic yeah. in the team, commiserating with them if they have some personal issue, helping them if he could, and generally being much more than a racing driver, you know, being a, a manager, if you like. And, 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 and Max, completely different style, but Max is that too, because he's got so much respect from everybody with whom he works. Absolutely, mate. And then from Mary, Mary says, if... There's a lot of chat about cost cap breaches again. If one of the teams were to breach, do you think we'd be in a similar ABA situation or do you reckon they might do the FIA might come down a bit more seriously on a team second year round? Uh, well, based on what you were saying at the start uh, <laughs> about true. how they'd love to see Red Bull clip back a bit and everybody else get a bit closer, if anybody else breaches the cost cap and they have a performance improvement, I imagine everyone will turn a blind eye and say, yeah, go for it. <laughs> um, and that is coming under the heading of money doesn't necessarily equal a faster car anyway because you've got to know what to do with that money and you've got to know what questions to ask of the wind tunnel model before you put it in the wind tunnel. You can't just expect the wind tunnel to make you a quick car. That's why it's about people. It's not about technology as such. So I don't know. I'm not the right guy to ask about the budget cap because I think it's all rubbish anyway. And I, and I just don't see the point of it. And I think there are plenty of other ways you could curb Formula One's development. And, you know, it was quite shocking to me to hear Greg Maffey, the, I think he's the president of Liberty on the Grid Live, talking in Canada about how um, they wanted, he wanted to go to a universal gearbox for all the teams Ooh. because... You know, that's just another step down. Why don't we just call it F2 and, and just everybody runs with Dallara chassis? And I, I was shocked that he did that live on TV. And, um, you know, uh, anyway, uh, I, I know it's been talked about before. I know the teams correctly said, no, we're not going down that path. But it's obviously something that's on their agenda. And that's under the heading of 
Well, it's not any cost saving. He was saying, oh, and we'll get somebody to badge all the engines and all the gearbox. Someone will pay us a lot of money to run a standard gearbox. And it sounds like they had a profit in mind for that. And oh. uh, it all just didn't seem right to me. And uh, that's not the Formula One that I know or currently like. So... Yeah, I hope it doesn't go down that path. But as I'm not really the right person because I never, I never agreed that the cost cap thing was a good thing for Formula One. I think there were too many ways around it anyway, and and I don't think that you should artificially limit some teams who, who do a better job with technology and finding money to the expense of of uh, you know that cap. And it hasn't really changed anything, has it? Really? Okay, I, I I agree with you, Peter. I think if I'm just if I'm putting my betting cap on. If we think back to Mercedes and party mode, they've, the FI have never been shy to make it more of more entertainment than sport, right? And I think I just I suspect they'll do it again. It's a matter of when, not if, for me. I, I I'm pretty sure they will do it. Um, yeah. and I then, think to finish my oh, yeah, comment no, on budget cap, until they get rid of all the motorhomes at the European races and just have little porter cabins with sawdust on the floor. I don't think they should talk about budget cap, to be honest. <laughs> I love it, Peter. Oh, okay, finally, um, Macon says, if you were to pick a driver from of the 20 currently on the grid to fix for the ills of that we've just talked about with Ferrari, who would that driver be, Peter? Um well, I don't think a Ferrari. I don't think a driver can fix the ills because they got Charles Leclerc, who's one of the best three drivers in the world at the moment, and he doesn't seem to be able to do anything. So, um, I don't think a driver could. I can't think of a driver that could fix the ills, unless unless Max Verstappen said to Adrian, "I want to go to Ferrari, but I'm only going to go there if you go, and I've arranged a three billion pound oh. retainer for you over the next <laughs> five years. Will you come with me?" and Max goes, then yes, I think Ferrari would be a better team for sure. But I don't see, I don't think that's going to happen. And uh, I don't think Max would want to do that anyway. He's got too nice a setup where he is. And so there you go. I don't see, I mean, if Lewis went there, I don't think he'd do any different from, differently from, from Charles because it would be the same, same stuff, wouldn't it? What, yeah. what would Lewis do that Charles can't do or isn't doing. Maybe, so I don't think maybe. any driver could, unless they can take Adrian Newey with them or another engineer. I mean, I'm being slightly cynical about Adrian because obviously, you I know, mean, he's not going to be around forever and there, yeah, there yeah. are like, very good engineers out there as well. Um, so uh, it's a driver that needs to have a package, not just a driver on his own. And if you think about, you know, what, what Nicky did at Ferrari, it was all about running the team with Luca Montezemolo uh, and, and basically his own guys. And it, went, and it was exactly the same when Michael went there. You know, it was all Ross Braun and, and the Benison set up, really, yeah. and Bridgestone exclusively then with Bridgestone. And that was a package that Michael and Todd put together. Yeah, yeah. So and I don't think a driver today is capable of putting that sort of power package together oh. and taking it to Ferrari. That's the problem. It's a shame, Peter. I don't think there are any drivers out there who know how to put a power package together anyway. Yeah, yeah, fair. Really, to be honest. I suppose if I you work... Think they're, all, they're all so focused on what they do as racing yeah. drivers. They don't really think in terms of a way, you know, a, a Michael used to think. A different era, I suppose. And again, this is the problem with the, the old intergenerational comparisons. Well, it's... and it's also the problem is the contracts now because there's so much... Uh, because they're so paranoid about the IT... Um, was it the IP, sorry, not IT, the IP, that they have got all these contracts with engineers now. And they, you know, they're long term contracts, most of them, with five years of gardening leave built into them. And it's quite difficult to do what Michael did because all the good engineers are tied up for too long to make an instant move instantaneous, yeah. instantaneously yeah. successful. Oh, mate. The, the world of F1 is, is, a, is so well, yeah, and wonderful. Well, yeah, but it's an interesting world. And yeah. I say that, that, what we've just been talking about there, that's your Netflix show, part two. <laughs> it's <so> true. <laughs> but, it's, you know, mm. but they don't do that side of it. And, but they should, because then you wouldn't be under the, wouldn't have the problem of thinking, oh, yeah, but, you know, Formula One's getting very boring now. We've got to make sure that it doesn't get boring. You just cover all the aspects of Formula One and you realise Formula One is never boring. It's never, ever boring. There's always the next race. I, I agree with you, Peter. There's always 
There's always yeah. a plot line, but I, I yeah. just feel and like... If, if anybody thinks Formula One is boring, just because a guy as good as Max Verstappen and an engineer as good as Adrian Newey does, produces the package they have, then they don't understand Formula One. And if they don't understand it, then we need to do a better job of explaining to them what it's all about. There you go. I think that's the point. I feel like the Netflix drive to survive not miss sells miss sells is too strong a word but almost misrepresents well it just what it, everyone it, is no, right it doesn't it, i don't think it misrepresents i think it just takes a very very small sample of what formula 1 is uh, and it's a great taste to it but let's see the real yeah. meal now instead of just all this little bit of icing that we keep eating you know christmas cake isn't just marzipan <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. I love the analogy. Peter, you're an absolute legend. You've been more than generous with your time. If you like these Peter the Windsor conversations that you can't get anywhere else on the internet, by the way, <laughs> get over to his YouTube channel, like, comment, and subscribe to all of the latest videos. The Monaco one is absolutely genius. Wicked pictorials that you can't get anywhere else. Um, Oh, you've been a legend. Peter, thank you so much for the time, sir. Cameron, thank you, mate. If you've, you've always been very kind and very helpful to me and oh. um, all the best to you. I know you're uh, focusing more and more now on, on your content and anything we as the fans can do to help you, oh. you know, we will. You're oh, a good man. Peter, means a lot. Means a lot, mate. Subscribers, do me a favor, like, comment. If you're listening on a podcasting platform, please do me a favor and scroll to the top and drop a five star rating because we're going purple sectors only for 2023. Thank you for watching another episode. We will see you same time, same place next week. Between now and then, do me a favor, look, but never stare. <laughs>